This is section twenty eight of Mark Twain A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume one, part one, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter twenty eight Piloting and Prophecy. Those who knew Samuel Clemens best in those days say that he was a slender, fine looking man, well dressed, even dandified given to patent leathers, blue serge, white duck, and fancy striped shirts. Old for his years, he heightened his appearance at times by wearing his beard in the atrocious mutton-chop fashion, then popular, but becoming to no one, least of all to him. The pilots regarded him as a great reader, a student of history, travels, literature, and the sciences a young man whom it was an education as well as an entertainment to know. When not at the wheel, he was likely to be reading or telling yarns in the association rooms. He began the study of French one day when he passed a school of languages where three tongues, French, German, and Italian, were taught, one in each of three rooms. The price was twenty-five dollars for one language or three for fifty dollars. The student was provided with a set of cards for each room, and supposed to walk from one apartment to another, changing tongues at each threshold. With his usual enthusiasm and prodigality, the young pilot decided to take all three languages, but after the first two or three round trips concluded that, for the present, French would do. He did not return to the school, but kept his cards and bought textbooks. He must have studied pretty faithfully when he was off watch and in port, for his river notebook contains a French exercise, all neatly written, and it is from the dialogues of Voltaire. This old notebook is interesting for other things. The notes are no longer timid, hesitating memoranda, but vigorous records made with the dash of assurance that comes from confidence and knowledge, and with the authority of one in supreme command. Under the head of second high-water trip, January 1861, Alonzo Child, we have the story of a rising river with its overflowing banks, its blind passages and cut-offs, all the circumstance and uncertainty of change. Good deal of water all over Coles Creek chute, twelve or fifteen feet bank, could have gone up shore above general tailors too much drift night didn't run either seventy seven or seventy six towheads eight foot bank on main shore ozark shoot and so on page after page of cryptographic memoranda it means little enough to the lay reader yet one gets an impression somehow of the swirling turbulent water and a lonely figure in that high glassed-in place peering into the dark for blind landmarks and possible dangers, picking his way up the dim, hungry river of which he must know every foot as well as a man knows the hall of his own home. All the qualifications must come into play, then memory, judgment, courage, and the high art of steering. Steering is a very high art he says. One must not keep a rudder dragging across a boat's stern if he wants to get up the river fast. He had an example of the perfection of this art one misty night on the Alonzo Child. Nearly fifty years later, sitting on his veranda in the dark, he recalled it. He said, There was a pilot in those days by the name of jack leonard who was a perfectly wonderful creature i do not know that jack knew any more about the river than most of us and perhaps could not read the water any better but he had a knack of steering away ahead of our ability and i think he must have had an eye that could see farther into the darkness i had never seen leonard steer but i had heard a good deal about it i had heard it said that the crankiest old tub afloat 
one that would kill any other man to handle, would obey and be as docile as a child when Jack Leonard took the wheel. I had a chance one night to verify that for myself. We were going up the river, and it was one of the nastiest nights I ever saw. Besides that, the boat was loaded in such a way that she steered very hard, and I was half blind and crazy trying to locate the safe channel, and was pulling my arms out to keep her in it. It was one of those nights when everything looks the same, whichever way you look. Just two long lines where the sky comes down to the trees, and where the trees meet the water with all the trees precisely the same height, all planted on the same day, as one of the boys used to put it, and not a thing to steer by except the knowledge in your head of the real shape of the river. Some of the boats had what they call a night hawk on the jackstaff, a thing which you could see when it was in the right position against the sky or the water, though it seldom was in the right position, and was generally pretty useless. I was in a bad way that night, and wondering how I could ever get through it, when the pilot-house door opened, and Jack Leonard walked in. He was a passenger that trip, and I had forgotten he was aboard. I was just about in the worst place, and was pulling the boat first one way, then another, running the wheel backward and forward, and climbing it like a squirrel. Sam, he said, let me take the wheel. Maybe I have been over this place since you have. I didn't argue the question. Jack took the wheel, gave it a little turn one way, then a little turn the other. That old boat settled down as quietly as a lamb, went right along as if it had been broad daylight in a river without snags, bars, bottom, or banks, or anything that one could possibly hit. I never saw anything so beautiful. He stayed my watch out for me, and I hope I was decently grateful. I have never forgotten it. The old notebook contained the record of many such nights as that, but there were other nights, too, when the stars were blazing out, or when the moon on the water made the river a wide, mysterious way of speculative dreams. He was always speculating. The planets and the remote suns were always a marvel to him. A love of astronomy, the romance of it, its vast distances, and its possibilities, began with those lonely river watches, and never waned to his last day. For a time a great comet blazed in the heavens, a wonderful sheaf of light that glorified his lonely watch. Night after night he watched it as it developed and then grew dim, and he read eagerly all the comet literature that came to his hand, then or afterward. He speculated of many things, of life, death, the reason of existence, of creation, the ways of providence and destiny. It was a fruitful time for such meditation. Out of such vigils grew those larger philosophies that would find expression later when the years had conferred the magic gift of phrase. Life lay all ahead of him then, and during those still watches he must have revolved many theories of how the future should be met and mastered. In the old notebook there still remains a well-worn clipping, the words of some unknown writer which he had preserved, and may have consulted as a sort of creed. It is an interesting little document, a prophetic one the reader may concede. How to take life. Take it just as though it was, as it is, an earnest, vital, and important affair. Take it as though you were born to the task of performing a merry part in it, as though the world had awaited for your coming. 
take it as though it was a grand opportunity to do and achieve to carry forward great and good schemes to help and cheer a suffering weary it may be heartbroken brother now and then a man stands aside from the crowd labors earnestly steadfastly confidently and straightway becomes famous for wisdom intellect skill greatness of some sort the world wonders admires idolizes and it only illustrates what others may do if they take hold of life with a purpose the miracle or the power that elevates the few is to be found in their industry application and perseverance under the promptings of a brave determined spirit the old notebook contains no record of disasters horace bixby who should know has declared sam clemens never had an accident either as a steersman or as a pilot except once when he got aground for a few hours in the bagasse came smoke with no damage to anybody though of course there was some good luck in that too for the best pilots do not escape trouble now and then bigsby and clemens were together that winter on the alonzo child and a letter to orion contains an account of great feasting which the two enjoyed at a french restaurant in new orleans dissipating on a ten dollar dinner a tell it not to ma where they had sheep's head fish oysters birds mushrooms and what not after which the day was too far gone to do anything so it appears that he was not always reading macaulay or studying french and astronomy but sometimes went frivoling with his old chief now his chum always his dear friend another letter records a visit with pamela to a picture gallery in st louis where was being exhibited church's heart of the andes he describes the picture in detail and with vast enthusiasm i have seen it several times he concludes but it is always a new picture totally new you seem to see nothing the second time that you saw the first further along he tells of having taken his mother and the girls his cousin ella creel and another for a trip down the river to new orleans ma was delighted with her trip but she was disgusted with the girls for allowing me to embrace and kiss them and she was horrified at the shottish as performed by miss castle and myself she was perfectly willing for me to dance until twelve o'clock at the imminent peril of my going to sleep on the after watch but then she would top off with a very inconsistent sermon on dancing in general ending with a terrific broadside aimed at that heresy of heresies the shottish i took ma and the girls in a carriage round that portion of new orleans where the finest gardens and residences are to be seen and although it was a blazing hot dusty day they seemed hugely delighted to use an expression which is commonly ignored in polite society they were hell-bent on stealing some of the luscious-looking oranges from branches which overhung the fence but i restrained them in another letter of this period we get a hint of the future mark twain it was written to john t moore a young clerk on the john j row what a fool old adam was had everything his own way had succeeded in gaining the love of the best-looking girl in the neighborhood but yet unsatisfied with his conquest he had to eat a miserable little apple ah john if you had been in his place you would not have eaten a mouthful of the apple that is if it had required 
any exertion. I have noticed that you shun exertion. There comes in the difference between us. I court exertion. I love work. Why, sir, when I have a piece of work to perform, I go away to myself, sit down in the shade, and muse over the coming enjoyment. Sometimes I am so industrious that I muse too long. There remains another letter of this period, a sufficiently curious document. There was in those days a famous New Orleans clairvoyant known as Madame Caprel. Some of the young pilot's friends had visited her, and obtained what seemed to be satisfying results. From time to time they had urged him to visit the fortune-teller, and one idle day he concluded to make the experiment. As soon as he came away he wrote to Orion in detail. "'She's a very pleasant little lady, rather pretty, about twenty-eight, say five feet, two and a quarter, would weigh a hundred and sixteen, has black eyes and hair, is polite and intelligent, used good language, and talks much faster than I do. She invited me into the little back parlor, closed the door, and we were alone. We sat down facing each other. Then she asked my age. Then she put her hands before her eyes a moment, and commenced talking as if she had a good deal to say, and not much time to say it in. Something after this style. Madame, yours is a watery planet. You gain your livelihood on the water. But you should have been a lawyer. There is where your talents lie. You might have distinguished yourself as an orator, or as an editor. You have written a great deal. You write well, but you are rather out of practice. No matter, you will be in practice some day. You have a superb constitution, and as excellent health as any man in the world. You have great powers of endurance. In your profession, your strength holds out against the longest sieges without flagging. Still, the upper part of your lungs, the top of them, is slightly affected. You must take care of yourself. You do not drink, but you use entirely too much tobacco, and you must stop it. Mind, not moderate, but stop the use of it totally. Then I can almost promise you eighty-six, when you will surely die. Otherwise, look out for twenty-eight, thirty-one, thirty-four, forty-seven, and sixty-five. Be careful, for you are not of a long-lived race, that is, on your father's side. You are the only healthy member of your family, and the only one in it who has anything like the certainty of attaining to a great age. So stop using tobacco and be careful of yourself. In some respects you take after your father, but you are much more like your mother, who belongs to the long-lived energetic side of the house. You never brought all your energies to bear upon any subject but what you accomplished it. For instance, you are self-made, self-educated, SLC, which proves nothing. Madame, don't interrupt. When you sought your present occupation, you found a thousand obstacles in your way, obstacles unknown, not even suspected by any save you and me, since you keep such matter to yourself. But you fought your way, 
and hid the long struggle under a mask of cheerfulness, which saved your friend's anxiety on your account. To do all this requires the qualities which I have named. S.L.C. You flatter well, madame. Madame, don't interrupt. Up to within a short time you had always lived from hand to mouth. Now you are in easy circumstances, for which you need give credit to no one but yourself. The turning point in your life occurred in 1840-7-8. S.L.C. Which was? Madame. A death, perhaps, and this threw you upon the world, and made you what you are. It was always intended that you should make yourself. Therefore it was well that this calamity occurred as early as it did. You will never die of water, although your career upon it in the future seems well sprinkled with misfortune. You will continue upon the water for some time yet. You will not retire finally until ten years from now. What is your brother's age? Twenty-three, and a lawyer, and in pursuit of an office? Well, he stands a better chance than the other two, and he may get it. He is too visionary, is always flying off on a new hobby. This will never do. Tell him I said so. He is a good lawyer, a very good lawyer, and a fine speaker, is very popular and much respected, and makes many friends. But although he retains their friendship, he loses their confidence by displaying his instability of character. The land he has now will be very valuable after a while. S.L.C. Say 250 years hence, or thereabouts, madame. Madame. No, less time, but never mind the land. That is a secondary consideration. Let him drop that for the present, and devote himself to his business and politics with all his might, for he must hold offices under government. After a while you will possess a good deal of property, retire at the end of ten years, after which your pursuits will be literary. Try the law, you will certainly succeed. I am done now. If you have any questions to ask, ask them freely, and if it be in my power, I will answer without reserve, without reserve. I asked a few questions of minor importance, paid her, and left, under the decided impression that going to the fortune-tellers was just as good as going to the opera and cost scarcely a trifle more. Ergo, I will disguise myself and go again one of these days, when other amusements fail. Now, isn't she the devil? <laughs> that is to say, isn't she a right smart little woman? When you want money, let Ma know, and she will send it. She and Pamela are always fussing about change, so I sent them a hundred and twenty quarters yesterday. Fiddlers change enough to last till I get back, I reckon. Sam. In the light of preceding and subsequent events, we must confess that Madame Caprel was indeed a right smart little woman. She made mistakes enough, the letter is not quoted in full, but when we remember that she not only gave his profession at the moment, but at least suggested his career for the future, that she approximated the year of his father's death as the time when he was thrown upon the world, that she admonished him against his besettling habit, tobacco, 
that she read minutely not only his characteristics but his brother orion's that she outlined the struggle in his conquest of the river that she seemingly had knowledge of orion's legal bent and his connection with the tennessee land all seems remarkable enough supposing of course she had no material means of acquiring knowledge one can never know certainly about such things end of chapter twenty eight piloting and prophecy read by john greenman this is section twenty nine of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter twenty nine the end of piloting it is curious however that madame caprell with clairvoyant vision should not have seen an important event then scarcely more than two months distant the breaking out of the civil war with the closing of the river and the end of mark twain's career as a pilot perhaps these things were so near as to be this side the range of second sight there had been plenty of war talk but few of the pilots believed that war was really coming traveling that great commercial highway the river with intercourse both of north and south they did not believe that any political differences would be allowed to interfere with the nation's trade or would be settled otherwise than on the street corners in the halls of legislation and at the polls true several states including louisiana had declared the union a failure and seceded but the majority of opinions were not clear as to how far a state had rights in such a matter or as to what the real meaning of secession might be comparatively few believed it meant war samuel clemens had no such belief his madame caprell letter bears date of february sixth eighteen sixty one yet contains no mention of war or of any special excitement in new orleans no forebodings as to national conditions such things came soon enough president lincoln was inaugurated on the fourth of march and six weeks later fort sumter was fired upon men began to speak out then and to take sides it was a momentous time in the association rooms there were pilots who would go with the union there were others who would go with the confederacy horace bixby was one of the former and in due time became chief of the union river service another pilot named montgomery samuel clemens had once steered for him declared for the south and later commanded the confederate mississippi fleet they were all good friends and their discussions though warm were not always acrimonious but they took sides a good many were not very clear as to their opinions living both north and south as they did they saw various phases of the question and divided their sympathies some were of one conviction one day and of another the next samuel clemens was of the less radical element he knew there was a good deal to be said for either cause furthermore he was not then bloodthirsty a pilot-house with its elevated position and transparency seemed a poor place to be in when fighting was going on i'll think about it he said i'm not very anxious to get up into a glass perch and be shot at by either side i'll go home and reflect on the matter he did not realize it but he had made his last trip as a pilot it is rather curious that his final brief notebook entry should begin with his future nom de plume a memorandum of soundings mark twain and should end with the words no lead he went up the river as a passenger on a steamer named the uncle sam zeb leavenworth was one of the pilots and sam clemens usually stood watch with him they heard war talk all the way and saw preparations but they were not molested though at memphis they barely escaped the blockade at cairo illinois they saw soldiers drilling troops later commanded by grant the uncle sam came steaming up toward st louis those on board congratulating themselves on having come through unscathed they were not quite through though however abreast of jefferson barracks they suddenly heard the boom of a cannon 
and saw a great whirl of smoke drifting in their direction. They did not realize that it was a signal, a thunderous halt, and kept straight on. Less than a minute later there was another boom, and a shell exploded directly in front of the pilot-house, breaking a lot of glass and destroying a good deal of the upper decoration. Zeb Leavenworth fell back into a corner with a yell. "'Good Lord Almighty, Sam!' he said. "'What do they mean by that?' Clemens stepped to the wheel and brought the boat around. "'I guess they want us to wait a minute, Zeb,' he said. They were examined and passed. It was the last steamboat to make the trip from New Orleans to St. Louis. Mark Twain's pilot days were over. He would have grieved had he known this fact. I loved the profession far better than any I have followed since, he long afterward declared, and I took a measureless pride in it. The dreamy, easy, romantic existence suited him exactly. A sovereign and an autocrat, the pilot's word was law. He wore his responsibilities as a crown. As long as he lived, Samuel Clemens would return to those old days with fondness and affection, and with regret that they were no more. End of chapter 29 The End of Piloting Read by John Greenman This is section 30 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 30, The Soldier. Clemens spent a few days in St. Louis, in retirement, for there was a pressing war demand for Mississippi pilots, then went up to Hannibal to visit old friends. They were glad enough to see him, and invited him to join a company of gay military enthusiasts who were organizing to help Governor Clabe Jackson repel the invader. A good many companies were forming in and about Hannibal, and sometimes purposes were conflicting and badly mixed. Some of the volunteers did not know for a time which invader they intended to drive from Missouri soil, and more than one company in the beginning was made up of young fellows whose chief ambition was to have a lark regardless as to which cause they might eventually espouse. The military organizations of Hannibal and Palmyra in 1861 were as follows. The Marion Artillery, the Silver Grays, Palmyra Guards, the W. E. Dennis Company, and one or two others. Most of them were small private affairs, usually composed of about half and half Union and Confederate men, who knew almost nothing of the questions or conditions, and disbanded in a brief time, to attach themselves to the regular service according as they developed convictions. The general idea of these companies was a little camping-out expedition and a good time. One such company, one morning, received unexpected reinforcements. They saw the approach of the recruits, and remarking how well drilled the new arrival seemed to be, mistook them for the enemy and fled. Samuel Clemens had by this time decided, like Lee, that he would go with his state and lead battalions to victory. The battalion, in this instance, consisted of a little squad of young fellows of his own age, mostly pilots and schoolmates, including Sam Bowen, Ed Stevens, Ab Grimes, about a dozen, all told. They organized secretly, for the Union militia was likely to come over from Illinois any time and look up any suspicious armies that made an open demonstration. An army might lose enthusiasm and prestige if it spent a night or two in the calaboose. So they met in a secret place above Bear Creek Hill, just as Tom Sawyer's red-handed bandits had gathered so long before. A good many of them were of the same lawless lot. And they planned how they would sell their lives on the field of glory, just as Tom Sawyer's band might have done if it had thought about playing war instead of Indian and pirate and bandit, with fierce raids on peach orchards and melon patches. Then, on the evening before marching away, they stealthily called on their sweethearts, those who had them did, and the others pretended sweethearts for the occasion. And when it was dark and mysterious they said good-bye, 
and suggested that maybe those girls would never see them again and as always happens in such a case some of them were in earnest and two or three of the little group that slipped away that night never did come back and somewhere sleep in unmarked graves the two sams sam bowen and sam clemens called on patty gore and julia willis for their good-bye visit and when they left invited the girls to walk through the pickets with them which they did as far as bear creek hill the girls didn't notice any pickets because the pickets were away calling on girls too and probably wouldn't be back to begin picketing for some time so the girls stood there and watched the soldiers march up bear creek hill and disappear among the trees the army had a good enough time that night marching through the brush and vines toward new london though this sort of thing grew rather monotonous by morning when they took a look at themselves by daylight with their nondescript dress and accoutrements there was something about it all which appealed to one's sense of humor rather than to his patriotism colonel rawls of rawls county however received them cordially and made life happier for them with a good breakfast and some encouraging words he was authorized to administer the oath of office he said and he proceeded to do it and made them a speech besides also he sent out notice to some of the neighbors to colonel bill splawn farmer nuck matson and others that the community had an army on its hands and perhaps ought to do something for it this brought in a number of contributions provisions paraphernalia and certain superfluous horses and mules which converted the battalion into a cavalry and made it possible for it to move on to the front without further delay samuel clemens mounted on a small yellow mule whose tail had been trimmed down to a tassel at the end in a style that suggested his name paintbrush upholstered and supplemented with an extra pair of cowskin boots a pair of gray blankets a homemade quilt frying pan a carpet sack a small valise an overcoat an old-fashioned kentucky rifle twenty yards of rope and an umbrella was a representative unit of the brigade the proper thing for an army loaded like that was to go into camp and they did it they went over on salt river near florida and camped not far from a farmhouse with a big log stable the latter they used as headquarters somebody suggested that when they went into battle they ought to have short hair so that in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict the enemy could not get hold of it tom lyon found a pair of sheep shears in the stable and acted as barber they were not very sharp shears but the army stood the torture for glory in the field and a group of little darkies collected from the farmhouse to enjoy the performance the army then elected its officers william ely was chosen captain with asa glasscock as first lieutenant samuel clemens was then voted second lieutenant and there were sergeants and orderlies there were only three privates when the election was over and these could not be distinguished by their deportment there was scarcely any discipline in this army then it set in to rain it rained by day and it rained by night salt river rose until it was bank full and overflowed the bottoms twice there was a false night alarm of the enemy approaching and the battalion went slopping through the mud and brush into the dark picking out the best way to retreat plodding miserably back to camp when the alarm was over once they fired a volley at a row of mullen stalks waving on the brow of a hill and once a picket shot at his own horse that had got loose and had wandered toward him in the dusk the rank and file did not care for picket duty sam bowen ordered by lieutenant clemens to go on guard one afternoon denounced his superior and had to be threatened with court-martial and death sam went finally but he sat in a hot open place and swore at the battalion and the war in general and finally went to sleep in the broiling sun these things began to tell on patriotism presently lieutenant clemens developed a boil and was obliged to make himself comfortable with some hay in a horse trough where he lay most of the day violently denouncing the war and the fools that invented it then word came that general tom harris who was in command of the district was stopping at a farmhouse two miles away living on the fat of the land that settled it 
Most of them knew Tom Harris, and they regarded his neglect of them as perfidy. They broke camp without further ceremony. Lieutenant Clemens needed assistance to mount paintbrush, and the little mule refused to cross the river. So Ab Grimes took the coil of rope, hitched one end of it to his own saddle, and the other end to paintbrush's neck. Grimes was mounted on a big horse, and when he started it was necessary for paintbrush to follow. Arriving at the farther bank, Grimes looked around, and was horrified to see that the end of the rope led down in the water with no horse and rider in view. He spurred up the bank, and the hat of Lieutenant Clemens and the ears of paintbrush appeared. Ah, said Clemens, as he mopped his face, do you know that little devil waded all the way across? A little beyond the river they met General Harris, who ordered them back to camp. They admonished him to go there himself. They said they had been in that camp and knew all about it. They were going now where there was food, real food, and plenty of it. Then he begged them, but it was no use. By and by they stopped at a farmhouse for supplies. A tall, bonny woman came to the door. "'You're secesh, ain't you?' They acknowledged that they were defenders of the cause, and that they wanted to buy provisions. The request seemed to inflame her. "'Provisions!' she screamed. "'Provisions for secesh! And my husband a colonel in the Union Army? You get out of here!' She reached for a hickory hoop-pole that stood by the door, and the army moved on. When they arrived at Colonel Bill Splawn's that night, Colonel Splawn and his family had gone to bed, and it seemed unwise to disturb them. The hungry army camped in the barnyard and crept into the hayloft to sleep. Presently somebody yelled, Fire! One of the boys had been smoking and started the hay. Lieutenant Clemens suddenly awakened, made a quick rolling movement from the blaze, and rolled out of a big hay window into the barnyard below. The rest of the army, startled into action, seized the burning hay and pitched it out the same window. The lieutenant had sprained his ankle when he struck the ground, and his boil was far from well, but when the burning hay descended he forgot his disabilities. Literally and figuratively this was the final straw. With a voice and vigor suited for the urgencies of the case, he made a spring from under the burning stuff, flung off the remnants, and with them his last vestige of interest in the war. The others, now that the fire was out, seemed to think the incident boisterously amusing. Whereupon the lieutenant rose up and told them, collectively and individually, what he thought of them. Also he spoke of the war and the Confederacy, and of the human race at large. They helped him in, then, for his ankle was swelling badly. Next morning, when Colonel Splawn had given them a good breakfast, the army set out for New London. But Lieutenant Clemens never got any farther than Nuck Matson's farmhouse. His ankle was so painful by that time that Mrs. Matson had him put to bed, where he stayed for several weeks, recovering from the injury and stress of war. A little negro boy was kept on watch for Union detachments. They were passing pretty frequently now, and when one came in sight the lieutenant was secluded until the danger passed. When he was able to travel he had had enough of war and the Confederacy. He decided to visit Orion in Keokuk. Orion was a Union abolitionist, and might lead him to mend his doctrines. As for the rest of the army, it was no longer a unit in the field. Its members had drifted this way and that, some to return to their occupations, some to continue in the trade of war. Sam Bowen is said to have been caught by the Federal troops and put to sawing wood in the stockade at Hannibal. Ab, A. C. Grimes, became a noted Confederate spy and is still among those who have lived to furnish the details here set down. Properly officered and disciplined, that detachment would have made as brave soldiers as any. Military effectiveness is a matter of leaders and tactics. Mark Twain's own private history of A Campaign That Failed is, of course, built on this episode. He gives us a delicious account, even if it does not strikingly resemble the occurrence. The story might have been still better if he had not introduced the shooting of the soldier in the dark. The incident was invented, of course, to present the real horror of war, but it seems incongruous in this burlesque campaign, and, to some extent at least, 
it missed fire in its intention. In a book recently published, Mark Twain's nephew is quoted as authority for the statement that Mark Twain was detailed for river duty, captured and paroled, captured again, and confined in a tobacco warehouse in St. Louis, etc. Mark Twain had but one nephew, Samuel E. Moffett, whose biographical sketch, volume 22, Mark Twain's works, contains no such statement, and nothing of the sort occurred. End of chapter 30, The Soldier read by John Greenman. This is section 31 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 31, Over the Hills and Far Away. When Madame Caprell prophesied that Orion Clemens would hold office under government, she must have seen with true clairvoyant vision. The inauguration of Abraham Lincoln brought Edward Bates into his cabinet, and Bates was Orion's friend. Orion applied for something, and got it. James W. Nye had been appointed territorial governor of Nevada, and Orion was made territorial secretary. He could strain a point and refer to the office as secretary of state which was an imposing title furthermore the secretary would be acting governor in the governor's absence and there would be various subsidiary honors when lieutenant clemens arrived in keokuk orion was in the first flush of his triumph and needed only money to carry him to the scene of new endeavor the late lieutenant c s a had accumulated money out of his pilot salary and there was no comfortable place just then in the active Middle West for an officer of either army who had voluntarily retired from the service. He agreed that if Orion would overlook his recent brief defection from the Union and appoint him now as his, Orion's, secretary, he would supply the funds for both overland passages, and they would start with no unnecessary delay for a country so new that all human beings, regardless of previous affiliations and convictions, were flung into the common fusing pot and recast in the general mold of pioneer. The offer was a boon to Orion. He was always eager to forgive, and the money was vitally necessary. In the briefest possible time he had packed his belongings, which included a large unabridged dictionary, and the brothers were on their way to St. Louis for final leave-taking before setting out for the great mysterious land of promise, the Pacific West. From St. Louis they took the boat for St. Joe, whence the overland stage started, and for six days plodded up the shallow, muddy, snaggy Missouri, a new experience for the pilot of the Father of Waters. In fact, the boat might almost as well have gone to St. Joe by land, for she was walking most of the time anyhow climbing over reefs and clambering over snags patiently and laboriously all day long. The captain said she was a bully boat, and all she wanted was some shear and a bigger wheel. I thought she wanted a pair of stilts, but I had the deep sagacity not to say so. Roughing it. At St. Joe they paid one hundred and fifty dollars apiece for their stage fare, with something extra for the dictionary, and on the 26th of July, 1861, set out on that long, delightful trip behind sixteen galloping horses or mules, never stopping except for meals or to change teams, heading steadily into the sunset, following it from horizon to horizon over the billowy plains, across the snow-clad Rockies, covering the seventeen hundred miles between St. Joe and Carson City, including a two-day halt in Salt Lake City, in nineteen glorious days. What an inspiration in such a trip! In Roughing It he tells it all, and says, Even at this day it thrills me, through and through, to think of the life, the gladness, and the wild sense of freedom that used to make the blood dance in my face on those fine overland mornings. 
the nights with the uneven mail bags for a bed and the bounding dictionary for company were less exhilarating but then youth does not mind all things being now ready stowed the uneasy dictionary where it would lie as quiet as possible and placed the water canteen and pistols where we could find them in the dark then we smoked a final pipe and swapped a final yarn after which we put the pipes tobacco and bag of coin in snug holes and caves among the mail bags and made the place as dark as the inside of a cow as the conductor phrased it in his picturesque way it was certainly as dark as any place could be nothing was even dimly visible in it and finally we rolled ourselves up like silkworms each person in his own blanket and sank peacefully to sleep youth loves that sort of thing despite its inconvenience and sometimes the clatter of the pony rider swept by in the night carrying letters at five dollars apiece and making the overland trip in eight days just a quick beat of hoofs in the distance a dash and a hail from the darkness the beat of hoofs again then only the rumble of the stage and the even swinging gallop of the mules sometimes they got a glimpse of the pony rider by day a flash as it were as he sped by and every morning brought new scenery new phases of frontier life including at last what was to them the strangest phase of all mormonism they spent two wonderful days at salt lake city that mysterious and remote capital of the great american monarchy who still flaunts her lawless orthodox creed the religion of david and solomon and thrives an obliging official made it his business to show them the city and the life there the result of which would be those amusing chapters in roughing it by and by the overland travelers set out refreshed from salt lake city and with a new supply of delicacies ham eggs and tobacco things that make such a trip worth while the author of roughing it assures us of this nothing helps scenery like ham and eggs ham and eggs and after these a pipe an old rank delicious pipe ham and eggs and scenery a downgrade a flying coach a fragrant pipe and a contented heart these make happiness it is what all the ages have struggled for but one must read all the story of that long ago trip it was a trip so well worth taking so well worth recording so well worth reading and rereading today we can only read of it now the overland stage long ago made its last trip and will not start any more even if it did the life and conditions the very scenery itself would not be the same end of chapter thirty one over the hills and far away read by john greenman this is section thirty two of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty two the pioneer it was a hot dusty august fourteenth that the stage reached carson city and drew up before the ormsby hotel it was known that the territorial secretary was due to arrive and something in the nature of a reception with refreshments and frontier hospitality had been planned governor nye formerly police commissioner in new york city had arrived a short time before and with his party of retainers healers we could call them now had made an imposing entrance perhaps something of the sort was expected with the advent of the secretary of state instead the committee saw two wayworn individuals climb down from the stage unkempt unshorn clothed in the roughest of frontier costume the same they had put on at st joe dusty grimy slouchy 
and weather-beaten with long days of sun and storm and alkali desert dust it is not likely there were two more unprepossessing officials on the pacific coast at that moment than the newly arrived territorial secretary and his brother somebody identified them and the committee melted away the half-formed plan of a banquet faded out and was not heard of again soap and water and fresh garments worked a transformation but that first impression had been fatal to festivities of welcome carson city the capital of nevada was a wooden town with a population of two thousand souls its main street consisted of a few blocks of small frame stores some of which are still standing in roughing it the author writes in the middle of the town opposite the stores was a plaza which is native to all towns beyond the rocky mountains a large unfenced level vacancy with a liberty pole in it and very useful as a place for public auctions horse trades and mass meetings and likewise for teamsters to camp in two other sides of the plaza were faced by stores offices and stables the rest of carson city was pretty scattering one sees the place pretty clearly from this brief picture of his but it requires an extract from a letter written to his mother somewhat later to populate it the mineral excitement was at its height in those days of the early sixties and had brought together such a congress of nations as only the greed for precious metal can assemble the sidewalks and streets of carson and the plaza thronged all day with a motley aggregation a museum of races which it was an education merely to gaze upon jane clemens had required him to write everything just as it was no better and no worse well he says gold hill sells at five thousand dollars per foot cash down wildcat isn't worth ten cents the country is fabulously rich in gold silver copper lead coal iron quicksilver marble granite chalk plaster of paris gypsum thieves murderers desperadoes ladies children lawyers christians indians chinamen spaniards gamblers sharpers coyotes pronounced coyotes poets preachers and jackass rabbits i overheard a gentleman say the other day that it was the damnedest country under the sun and that comprehensive conception i fully subscribed to it never rains here and the dew never falls no flowers grow here and no green thing gladdens the eye the birds that fly over the land carry their provisions with them only the crow and the raven tarry with us our city lies in the midst of a desert of the purest most unadulterated and uncompromising sand in which infernal soil nothing but that fag end of vegetable creation sagebrush ventures to grow i said we are situated in a flat sandy desert true and surrounded on all sides by such prodigious mountains that when you look disdainfully down from them upon the insignificant village of carson in that instant you are seized with a burning desire to stretch forth your hand put the city in your pocket and walk off with it 
as to churches i believe they have got a catholic one here but like that one the new york firemen spoke of i believe they would don't run her now carson has been through several phases of change since this was written for better and for worse it is a thriving place in these later days and new farming conditions have improved the country round about but it was a desert outpost then a catch-all for the human drift which every whirlwind of discovery sweeps along gold and silver hunting and mine speculations were the industries gambling drinking and murder were the diversions of the nevada capital politics developed in due course though whether as a business or a diversion is not clear at this time the clemens brothers took lodging with a genial irishwoman mrs murphy a new york retainer of governor nye who boarded the camp followers the mrs o'flanagan of roughing it this retinue had come in the hope of territorial pickings and mine adventure soldiers of fortune they were and a good-natured lot altogether one of them bob howland a nephew of the governor attracted samuel clemens by his clean-cut manner and commanding eye the man who has that eye doesn't need to go armed he wrote later he can move upon an armed desperado and quell him and take him a prisoner without saying a single word it was the same bob howland who would be known by and by as the most fearless man in the territory who as city marshal of aurora kept that lawless camp in subjection and when the friends of a lot of condemned outlaws were threatening an attack with general massacre sent the famous message to governor nye all quiet in aurora five men will be hung in an hour and it was quiet and the program was carried out but this is a digression and somewhat premature orion clemens anxious for laurels established himself in the meager fashion which he thought the government would approve and his brother finding neither duties nor salary attached to his secondary position devoted himself mainly to the study of human nature as exhibited under frontier conditions sometimes when the nights were cool he would build a fire in the office stove and with bob howland and a few other choice members of the brigade gathered around would tell river yarns in that inimitable fashion which would win him devoted audiences all his days his river life had increased his natural languor of habit and his slow speech heightened the lazy impression which he was never unwilling to convey his hearers generally regarded him as an easy-going indolent good fellow with a love of humor with talent perhaps but as one not likely ever to set the world afire they did not happen to think that the same inclination which made them crowd about to listen and applaud would one day win for him the attention of all mankind within a brief time sam clemens he was never known as otherwise than sam among those pioneers was about the most conspicuous figure on the carson streets his great bushy head of auburn hair his piercing twinkling eyes his loose lounging walk his careless disorder of dress drew the immediate attention even of strangers made them turn to look a second time and then inquire as to his identity he had quickly adapted himself to the frontier mode lately a river sovereign and dandy in fancy percales and patent leathers he had become the roughest of rough-clad pioneers in rusty slouch hat flannel shirt coarse trousers slopping half in and half out of the heavy cowskin boots always something of a barbarian in love with a loose habit of unconvention he went even further than others and became a sort of paragon of disarray the more energetic citizens of carson did not prophesy much for his future among them orion clemens with the stir and bustle of the official new broom earned their quick respect but his brother well they often saw him leaning for an hour or more at a time against an awning support at the corner of king and carson streets smoking a short clay pipe 
and staring drowsily at the human kaleidoscope of the plaza scarcely changing his position just watching studying lost in contemplation all of which was harmless enough of course but how could any one ever get a return out of employment like that samuel clemens did not catch the mining fever immediately there was too much to see at first to consider any special undertaking the mere coming to the frontier was for the present enough he had no plans his chief purpose was to see the world beyond the rockies to derive from it such amusement and profit as might fall in his way the war would end by and by and he would go back to the river no doubt he was already not far from homesick for the states and his associations there he closed one letter i heard a military band play what are the wild waves saying the other night and it brought ella creel and bell stoats across the desert in an instant for they sang the song in orion's yard the first time i ever heard it it was like meeting an old friend i tell you i could have swallowed that whole band trombone and all if such a compliment would have been any gratification to them his friends contracted the mining mania bob howland and raish phillips went down to aurora and acquired feet in many claims and wrote him enthusiastic letters with captain nye the governor's brother he visited them and was presented with an interest which permitted him to contribute an assessment every now and then toward the development of the mine but his enthusiasm still languished he was interested more in the native riches above ground than in those concealed under it he had heard that the timber around lake bigler tahoe promised vast wealth which could be had for the asking the lake itself and the adjacent mountains were said to be beautiful beyond the dream of art he decided to locate a timber claim on its shores he made the trip afoot with a young ohio lad john kinney and the account of this trip as set down in roughing it is one of the best things in the book the lake proved all they had expected more than they expected it was a veritable habitation of the gods with its delicious whiny atmosphere its vast colonnades of pines its measureless depths of water so clear that to drift on it was like floating high aloft in mid-nothingness they staked out a timber claim and made a semblance of fencing it and of building a habitation to comply with the law but their chief employment was a complete abandonment to the quiet luxury of that dim solitude wandering among the trees lounging along the shore or drifting on that transparent insubstantial sea they did not sleep in their house he says it never occurred to us for one thing and besides it was built to hold the ground and that was enough we did not want to strain it they lived by their campfire on the borders of the lake and one day it was just at nightfall it got away from them fired the forest and destroyed their fence and habitation his picture in roughing it of the superb night spectacle the mighty mountain conflagration reflected in the waters of the lake is splendidly vivid the reader may wish to compare it with this extract from a letter written to pamela at the time the level ranks of flame were relieved at intervals by the standard bearers as we call the tall dead trees wrapped in fire and waving their blazing banners a hundred feet in the air then we could turn from the scene to the lake and see every branch and leaf and cataract of flame upon its banks perfectly reflected as in a gleaming fiery mirror the mighty roaring of the conflagration together with our solitary and somewhat unsafe position for there was no one within six miles of us rendered the scene very impressive 
occasionally one of us would remove his pipe from his mouth and say superb magnificent beautiful but by the lord god almighty if we attempt to sleep in this little patch tonight we'll never live till morning this is good writing too but it lacks the fancy and the choice of phrasing which would develop later the fire ended their first excursion to tahoe but they made others and located other claims claims in which the folks at home mr moffett james lampton and others were included it was the same james lampton who would one day serve as a model for colonel sellers evidently samuel clemens had a good opinion of his business capacity in that earlier day for he writes this is just the country for cousin jim to live in i don't believe it would take him six months to make a hundred thousand dollars here if he had three thousand to commence with i suppose he can't leave his family though further along in the same letter his own overflowing seller's optimism develops orion and i have confidence enough in this country to think that if the war lets us alone we can make mr moffett rich without its ever costing him a cent or a particle of trouble this letter bears date of october twenty fifth and from it we gather that a certain interest in mining claims had by this time developed we have got about sixteen hundred and fifty feet of mining ground and if it proves good mr moffett's name will go in and if not i can get feet for him in the spring you see pamela the trouble does not consist in getting mining ground for there is plenty enough but the money to work it with after you get it he refers to pamela's two little children his niece annie and baby sam samuel e moffett in later life a well-known journalist and editor and promises to enter claims for them timber claims probably for he was by no means sanguine as yet concerning the mines that was a long time ago tahoe land is sold by the lot now to summer residents those claims would have been riches today but they were all abandoned presently forgotten in the delirium which goes only with the pursuit of precious ores end of chapter thirty two the pioneer read by john greenman this is section thirty three of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty three the prospector it was not until early winter that samuel clemens got the real mining infection everybody had it by that time the miracle is that he had not fallen an earlier victim the wildest stories of sudden fortune were in the air some of them undoubtedly true men had gone to bed paupers and on the verge of starvation and awakened to find themselves millionaires others had sold for a song claims that had been suddenly found to be fairly stuffed with precious ores cart loads of bricks silver and gold daily drove through the streets in the midst of these things reports came from the newly opened humboldt region flamed up with a radiance that was fairly blinding the papers declared that humboldt county was the richest mineral region on god's footstool the mountains were said to be literally bursting with gold and silver a correspondent of the daily territorial enterprise fairly wallowed in rhetoric yet found words inadequate to paint the measureless wealth of the humboldt mines no wonder those not already mad speedily became so no wonder samuel clemens with his natural tendency to speculative optimism yielded to the epidemic and became as frenzied 
as the craziest. The air to him suddenly began to shimmer. All his thoughts were of leads and ledges and veins. All his clouds had silver linings. All his dreams were of gold. He joined an expedition at once. He reproached himself bitterly for not having started earlier. Hurry was the word. We wasted no time. Our party consisted of four persons, a blacksmith, sixty years of age, two young lawyers, and myself. We bought a wagon and two miserable old horses. We put eighteen hundred pounds of provisions and mining tools in the wagon and drove out of Carson on a chilly December afternoon. In a letter to his mother he states that besides provisions and mining tools, their load consisted of certain luxuries, viz. ten pounds of Killikinick, Watts hymns, fourteen decks of cards, Dombey and Son, a cribbage board, one small keg of lager beer, and the Carmina Sacra. The two young lawyers were A. W. Gus Oliver, Oliphant in Roughing It, and W. H. Claggett. Sam Clemens had known Billy Claggett as a law student in Keokuk, and they were brought together now by this association. Both Claggett and Oliver were promising young men, and would be heard from in time. The blacksmith's name was Tillou, Baloo, a sturdy, honest soul with a useful knowledge of mining and the repair of tools. There were also two dogs in the party, a small curly-tailed mongrel, Kearney, the property of Mr. Tillou, and a young hound. The combination seemed a strong one. It proved a weak one in the matter of horses. Oliver and Clemens had furnished the team, and their selection had not been of the best. It was two hundred miles to Humboldt, mostly across sand. The horses could not drag their load and the miners too, so the miners got out. Then they found it necessary to push. Not because we were fond of it, Ma, oh no, but on Bunker's account. Bunker was the near horse on the larboard side, named after the Attorney General of this territory. My horse, and I am sorry you do not know him personally, Ma, for I feel toward him sometimes as if he were a blood relation of our family. He is so lazy, you know. My horse, I was going to say, was the off horse on the starboard side. But it was on Bunker's account, principally, that we pushed behind the wagon. In fact, Ma, that horse had something on his mind all the way to Humboldt. S. L. C. to his mother, published in the Keokuk, Iowa, Gate City. So they had to push, and most of that two hundred miles through snow and sandstorm they continued to push and swear and groan, sustained only by the thought that they must arrive at last when their troubles would all be at an end, for they would be millionaires in a brief time and never know want or fatigue any more. There were compensations. The campfire at night was cheerful, the food satisfying. They bundled close under the blankets and, when it was too cold to sleep, looked up at the stars, while the future entertainer of kings would spin yarn after yarn that made his hearers forget their discomforts. Judge Oliver, the last one of the party alive, in a recent letter to the writer of this history, says, He was the life of the camp, but sometimes there would come a reaction, and he could hardly speak for a day or two. One day a pack of wolves chased us, and the hound Sam speaks of never stopped to look back till he reached the next station many miles ahead. Judge Oliver adds that an Indian war had just ended, and that they occasionally passed the charred ruin of a shack and new graves. This was disturbing enough. Then they came to that desolation of desolations, the Alkali Desert, where the sand is of unknown depth, where the road is strewn thickly with the carcasses of dead beasts of burden, 
the charred remains of wagons chains bolts and screws which thirsty immigrants grown desperate have thrown away in the grand hope of being able when less encumbered to reach water they traveled all day and night pushing through that fierce waterless waste to reach camp on the other side it was three o'clock in the morning when they got across and dropped down utterly exhausted judge oliver in his letter tells what happened then the sun was high in the heavens when we were aroused from our sleep by a yelling band of paiute warriors we were upon our feet in an instant the pictures of burning cabins and the lonely graves we had passed were in our minds our scalps were still our own and not dangling from the belts of our visitors sam pulled himself together put his hand on his head as if to make sure he had not been scalped and then with his inimitable drawl said boys they have left us our scalps let's give them all the flour and sugar they ask for and we did give them a good supply for we were grateful they were eleven weary days pushing their wagon and team the two hundred miles to unionville humboldt county arriving at last in a driving snowstorm unionville consisted of eleven poor cabins built in the bottom of a canyon five on one side and six facing them on the other they were poor three-sided one-room huts the fourth side formed by the hill the roof a spread of white cotton stones used to roll down on them sometimes and mark twain tells of livestock specifically of a mule and cow that interrupted the patient long-suffering oliver who was trying to write poetry and only complained when at last an entire cow came rolling down the hill crashed through on the table and made a shapeless wreck of everything the innocents abroad judge oliver still does not complain but he denies the cow he says there were no cows in humboldt in those days so perhaps it was only a literary cow though in any case it will long survive judge oliver's name will go down with it to posterity in the letter which samuel clemens wrote home he tells of what they found in unionville national there was selling at fifty dollars per foot and assayed two thousand four hundred and ninety six dollars per ton at the mint in san francisco and the alda nueva peru delirio congress independent and others were immensely rich leads and moreover having winning ways with us we could get feet enough to make us all rich one of these days i confess with shame says the author of roughing it that i expected to find masses of silver lying all about the ground and he adds that he slipped away from the cabin to find a claim on his own account and tells how he came staggering back under a load of golden specimens also how his specimens proved to be only worthless mica and how he learned that in mining nothing that glitters is gold his account in roughing it of the humboldt mining experience is sufficiently good history to make detail here unnecessary tillou instructed them in prospecting and in time they located a fairly promising claim they went to work on it with pick and shovel then with drill and blasting powder then they gave it up one week of this satisfied me i resigned they tried to tunnel but soon resigned again it was pleasanter to prospect and locate and trade claims and acquire feet in every new ledge than it was to dig and about as profitable the golden reports of humboldt had been based on assays of selected rich specimens and were mainly delirium and insanity the clemens claggett oliver tillou combination never touched their claims again with pick and shovel though their faith or at least their hope in them 
did not immediately die. Billy Claggett put out his shingle as notary public, and Gus Oliver put out his as probate judge. Sam Clemens and Tallou, with a fat-witted, arrogant Prussian named Fursdorf, Ollendorf, set out for Carson City. It is not certain what became of the wagon and team, or of the two dogs. The Carson travelers were waterbound at a tavern on the Carson River, the scene of the Arkansas sketch, with a fighting, drinking lot. Fursdorf got them nearly drowned getting away, and finally succeeded in getting them absolutely lost in the snow. The author of Roughing It tells us how they gave themselves up to die, and how each swore off whatever he had in the way of an evil habit, how they cast their tempers, tobacco cards, and whiskey into the snow. He further tells us how next morning, when they woke to find themselves alive, within a few rods of a hostelry, they surreptitiously dug up those things again, and, deep in shame and luxury, resumed their fallen ways. It was the twenty-ninth of January when they reached Carson City. They had been gone not quite two months, one of which had been spent in travel. It was a brief period, but it contained an episode, and it seemed like years. End of chapter 33 The Prospector Read by John Greenman This is section 34 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 34 Territorial Characteristics. Meantime, the territorial secretary had found difficulties in launching the ship of state. There was no legislative hall in Carson City and if abram curry one of the original owners of the celebrated gould and curry mine curry old curry old abe curry as he called himself had not tendered the use of a hall rent free the first legislature would have been obliged to sit in the desert furthermore orion had met with certain acute troubles of his own the government at washington had not appreciated his economies in the matter of cheap office rental and it had stipulated the price which he was to pay for public printing and various other services, prices fixed according to Eastern standards. These prices did not obtain in Nevada, and when Orion, confident that because of his other economies the controller would stretch a point and allow the increased frontier tariff, he was met with the usual thick-headed official lack of imagination, with the result that the excess paid was deducted from his slender salary. With a man of less conscience this condition would easily have been offset by another, wherein other rates, less arbitrary, would have been adjusted to negotiate the official deficit. With Orion Clemens such a remedy was not even considered. Yielding, unstable, blown by every wind of influence though he was, Orion's integrity was a rock. Governor Nye was among those who presently made this discovery. Old politician that he was, former police commissioner of New York City, Nye took care of his own problems in the customary manner. To him, politics was simply a game to be played to win. He was a popular, jovial man, well-liked and thought of, but he did not lie awake, as Orion did, planning economies for the government, or how to make up excess charges out of his salary. To him, Nevada was simply a doorway to the United States Senate and in the meantime his brigade required official recognition and perquisites. The governor found Orion Clemens an impediment to this policy. Orion could not be brought to a proper political understanding of special bills and accounts, and relations between the Secretary of State and the governor were becoming strained. It was about this time that the man who had been potentate of the pilot house of a Mississippi River steamer returned from Humboldt. He was fond of the governor, but he had still higher regard for the family integrity. When he had heard Orion's troubled story, he called on Governor Nye and delivered himself in his own fashion. In his former employments he had acquired a vocabulary and moral backbone sufficient to his needs. We may regret that no stenographic report was made of the interview, 
it would be priceless now but it is lost we only know that orion's rectitude was not again assailed and that curiously enough governor nye apparently conceived a strong admiration and respect for his brother samuel clemens minor remained but a brief time in carson city only long enough to arrange for a new and more persistent venture he did not confess his humboldt failure to his people in fact he had not as yet confessed it to himself his avowed purpose was to return to humboldt after a brief investigation of the esmeralda mines he had been paying heavy assessments on his holdings there and with a knowledge of mining gained at unionville he felt that his personal attention at aurora might be important as a matter of fact he was by this time fairly daft on the subject of mines and mining with the rest of the community for company his earlier praises of the wonders and climate of tahoe had inspired his sister pamela always frail with a desire to visit that health-giving land perhaps he felt that he recommended the country somewhat too highly by george pamela he said i begin to fear that i have invoked a spirit of some kind or other which i will find more than difficult to allay he proceeds to recommend california as a residence for any or all of them but he is clearly doubtful concerning nevada some people are malicious enough to think that if the devil were set at liberty and told to confine himself to nevada territory he would come here and look sadly around a while and then get homesick and go back to hell again why i have had my whiskers and mustaches so full of alkali dust that you'd have thought i worked in a starch factory and boarded in a flour barrel but then he can no longer restrain his youth and optimism how could he with a fortune so plainly in view it was already in his grasp in imagination he was on the way home with it i expect to return to st louis in july per steamer i don't say that i will return then or that i shall be able to do it but i expect to you bet i came down here from humboldt in order to look after our esmeralda interests yesterday bob howland arrived here and i have had a talk with him he owns with me in the horatio and darby ledge he says our tunnel is in fifty-two feet and a small stream of water has been struck which bids fair to become a big thing by the time the ledge is reached sufficient to supply a mill now if you knew anything of the value of water here you would perceive at a glance that if the water should amount to fifty or one hundred inches we wouldn't care whether school kept or not if the ledge should prove to be worthless we'd sell the water for money enough to give us quite a lift but you see the ledge will not prove to be worthless we have located nearby a fine site for a mill and when we strike the ledge you know we'll have a mill site water power and pay rock all handy then we shan't care whether we have capital or not mill folks will build us a mill and wait for their pay if nothing goes wrong we'll strike the ledge in june and if we do i'll be home in july you know he pauses at this point for a paragraph of self-analysis characteristic and crystal clear so just keep your clothes on pamela until i come don't you know that undemonstrated human calculations won't do to bet on don't you know that 
I have only talked as yet, but proved nothing. Don't you know that I have expended money in this country, but have made none myself? Don't you know that I have never held in my hands a gold or silver bar that belonged to me? Don't you know that it's all talk and no cider so far? Don't you know that people who always feel jolly, no matter where they are or what happens to them, who have the organ of hope preposterously developed, who are endowed with an unconcealable sanguine temperament, who never feel concerned about the price of corn, and who cannot, by any possibility, discover any but the bright side of a picture, are very apt to go to extremes and exaggerate with forty-horse microscopic power? But, but, in the bright lexicon of youth there is no such word as fail, and I'll prove it whereupon he lets himself go again full tilt by george if i just had a thousand dollars i'd be all right now there's the horatio for instance there are five or six shareholders in it and i know i could buy half of their interests at say twenty dollars per foot now that flour is worth fifty dollars per barrel and they are pressed for money but I am hard up myself and can't buy, and in June they'll strike the ledge, and then, good-bye, canary, I can't get it for love or money. Twenty dollars a foot. Think of it. For ground that is proven to be rich. Twenty dollars, madam, and we wouldn't part with a foot of our seventy-five for five times the sum." so it will be in Humboldt next summer. The boys will get pushed and sell ground for a song that is worth a fortune, but I am at the helm now. I have convinced Orion that he hasn't business talent enough to carry on a peanut stand, and he has solemnly promised me that he will meddle no more with mining or other matters not connected with the secretary's office. So, you see, if mines are to be bought or sold, or tunnels run, or shafts sunk, parties have to come to me, and me only. I'm the firm, you know. There are pages of this, all glowing with golden expectations and plans. Ah, well. We have all written such letters home at one time and another, of gold mines of one form or another. He closes at last with a bit of pleasantry for his mother. Ma says, It looks like a man can't hold public office and be honest. Why, certainly not, madam. A man can't hold public office and be honest. Lord bless you, it is a common practice with Orion to go about town stealing little things that happen to be lying around loose, and I don't remember having heard him speak the truth since we have been in Nevada. He even tries to prevail upon me to do these things, Ma, but I wasn't brought up that way, you know. You showed the public what you could do in that line when you raised me, madam. But then you ought to have raised me first, so that Orion could have had the benefit of my example. Do you know that he stole all the stamps out of an eight-stamp quartz mill one night, and brought them home under his overcoat and hid them in the back room end of chapter 34 territorial characteristics read by john greenman
This is section thirty five of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume one, part one, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter thirty five. The Minor. He had about exhausted his own funds by this time, and it was necessary that Orion should become the financier. The brothers owned their Esmeralda claims in partnership and it was agreed that orion out of his modest depleted pay should furnish the means while the other would go actively into the field and develop their riches neither had the slightest doubt but that they would be millionaires presently and both were willing to struggle and starve for the few intervening weeks it was february when the printer pilot miner arrived in aurora that rough turbulent camp of the esmeralda district lying about one hundred miles south of Carson City, on the edge of California, in the Sierra Slopes. Everything was frozen and covered with snow, but there was no lack of excitement and prospecting and grabbing for feet in this ledge and that, buried deep under the ice and drift. The new arrival camped with Horatio Phillips, Raish, in a tiny cabin with a domestic roof, the ruins of it still stands and they cooked and bunked together and combined their resources in a common fund. Bob Howland joined them presently, and later an experienced miner, Calvin H. Higby, Cal, one day to be immortalized in the story of Roughing It, and in the dedication of that book. Around the cabin stove they would gather and paw over their specimens, or test them with a blowpipe and horn spoon, after which they would plan tunnels and figure estimates of prospective wealth. Never mind if the food was poor and scanty, and the chill wind came in everywhere, and the roof leaked like a filter. They were living in a land where all the mountains were banked with nuggets, where all the rivers ran gold. Bob Howland declared later that they used to go out at night and gather up empty champagne bottles and fruit tins and pile them in the rear of their cabin to convey to others the appearance of affluence and high living. When they lacked for other employment and were likely to be discouraged, the ex-pilot would ride the bunk and smoke and, without money and without price, distribute riches more valuable than any they would ever dig out of those Esmeralda hills. At other times he talked little or not at all, but sat in one corner and wrote, wholly oblivious of his surroundings. They thought he was writing letters, though letters were not many, and only to Orion during this period. It was the old literary impulse stirring again, the desire to set things down for their own sake, the natural hunger for print. One or two of his earliest letters home had found their way into a Keokuk paper, the Gate City. Copies containing them had gone back to Orion, who had shown them to a representative of the territorial enterprise, a young man named Barstow, who thought them amusing. The enterprise reprinted at least one of these letters, or portions of it, and with this encouragement the author of it sent an occasional contribution direct to that paper over the pen name Josh. He did not care to sign his own name. He was a miner who was soon to be a magnate. He had no desire to be known as a camp scribbler. He received no pay for these offerings, and expected none. They were sketches of a broadly burlesque sort, the robust horseplay kind of humor that belongs to the frontier. They were not especially promising efforts. One of them was about an old ragabones of a horse, a sort of preliminary study of Oahu, of the Sandwich Islands, or Baalbek and Jericho of Syria. If any one had told him, or had told any reader of this sketch, that the author of it was knocking at the door of the House of Fame, such a person's judgment or sincerity would have been open to doubt. Nevertheless it was true, though the knock was timid and halting, and the summons to cross the threshold long delayed. A winter mining camp is the most bleak and comfortless of places. The saloon and gambling house furnished the only real warmth and cheer. Our Aurora miners would have been less than human, or more, if they had not found diversion now and then in the happy harbors of sin. Once there was a great ball given at a newly opened pavilion, 
and sam clemens is said to have distinguished himself by his unrestrained and spontaneous enjoyment of the tripping harmony cal higby who was present writes in changing partners whenever he saw a hand raised he would grasp it with great pleasure and sail off into another set oblivious to his surroundings sometimes he would act as though there was no use in trying to go right or to dance like other people and with his eyes closed he would do a hoedown or a double shuffle all alone talking to himself and saying that he never dreamed there was so much pleasure to be obtained at a ball it was all as natural as a child's play by the second set all the ladies were falling over themselves to get him for a partner and most of the crowd too full of mirth to dance were standing or sitting around dying with laughter what a child he always was always to the very end with the first break of winter the excitement that had been fermenting and stewing around camp stoves overflowed into the streets washed up the gullies and assailed the hills there came then a period of madness beside which the humbled excitement had been mere intoxication higby says it was amazing how wild the people became all over the pacific coast in san francisco and other large cities barbers hack drivers servant girls merchants and nearly every class of people would club together and send agents representing all the way from five thousand to five hundred thousand or more to buy mines they would buy anything in the shape of quartz whether it contained any mineral value or not the letters which went from the aurora miner to orion are humanly documentary they are likely to be staccato in their movement they show nervous haste in their composition eagerness and suppressed excitement they are not always coherent they are seldom humorous except in a savage way they are often profane they are likely to be violent even the handwriting has a terse look the flourish of youth has gone out of it altogether they reveal the tense anxiety of the gambling mania of which mining is the ultimate form an extract from a letter of april is a fair exhibit work not yet begun on the horatio and darby haven't seen it yet it is still in the snow shall begin on it within three or four weeks strike the ledge in july guess it is good worth from thirty dollars to fifty dollars a foot in california man named gephardt shot here yesterday while trying to defend a claim on last chance hill expect he will die these mills here are not worth a damn except clayton's and it is not in full working trim yet send me forty dollars or fifty dollars by mail immediately i go to work tomorrow with pick and shovel something's got to come by god before i let go here by the end of april work had become active in the mines though the snow in places was still deep and the ground stony with frost on the twenty eighth he writes i have been at work all day blasting and digging and damning one of our new claims dashaway which i don't think a great deal of but which i am willing to try we are down now ten or twelve feet we are following down under the ledge but not taking it out if we get up a windlass tomorrow we shall take out the ledge and see whether it is worth anything or not it must have been hard work picking away at the flinty ledges in the cold and the dash away would seem to have proven a disappointment for there is no promising mention of it again instead we hear of the flyaway and annapolitan and the live yankee and of a dozen others each of which holds out the beacon of hope for a little while and then passes from notice forever in may it is the monitor that is sure to bring affluence though realization is no longer regarded as immediate to use a french expression i have got my damned satisfy at last 
two years' time will make us capitalists in spite of anything. Therefore, we need fret and fume and worry and doubt no more, but just lie still and put up with privation for six months. Perhaps three months will let us out. Then, if government refuses to pay the rent on your new office, we can do it ourselves. We have got to wait six weeks anyhow for a dividend, maybe longer, but that it will come there is no shadow of a doubt. I have got the thing sifted down to a dead moral certainty. I own one-eighth of the new Monitor Ledge Clemens Company, and money can't buy a foot of it, because I know it to contain our fortune. The ledge is six feet wide, and one needs no glass to see gold and silver in it. When you and I came out here, we did not expect sixty-three or sixty-four to find us rich men, and if that proposition had been made, we would have accepted it gladly. Now it is made. I am willing, now, that Neary's tunnel, or anybody else's tunnel, shall succeed. Some of them may beat us a few months, but we shall be on hand in the fullness of time as sure as fate. I would hate to swap chances with any member of the tribe. It is the same man who twenty-five years later would fasten his faith and capital to a typesetting machine and refuse to exchange stock in it share for share with the Mergenthaler linotype. He adds, But I have struck my tent in Esmeralda, and I care for no mines but those which I can superintend myself. I am a citizen here now, and I am satisfied, although Ratio and I are strapped, and we haven't three days' rations in the house. I shall work the monitor and the other claims with my own hands. I prospected three-quarters of a pound of monitor yesterday, and Raish reduced it with the blowpipe and got about ten or twelve cents in gold and silver, besides the other half of it which we split on the floor and didn't get. I tried to break a handsome chunk from a huge piece of my darling monitor, which we brought from the croppings yesterday, but it all splintered up, and I send you the scraps. I call that choice, any damn fool would. Don't ask if it has been assayed, for it hasn't. It don't need it. It is simply able to speak for itself. It is six feet wide on top and traversed through with veins whose color proclaims their worth. What the devil does a man want with any more feet when he owns in the invincible bomb-proof monitor? There is much more of this and other such letters, most of them ending with demands for money. The living, the tools, the blasting powder, and the help eat it up faster than Orion's salary can grow. Send me fifty dollars, or one hundred dollars, all you can spare. Put away one hundred and fifty dollars, subject to my call. We shall need it soon for the tunnel. The letters are full of such admonition, and Orion, more insane, if anything, than his brother, is scraping his dollars and pennies together to keep the mines going. He is constantly warned to buy no claims on his own account, and promises faithfully, but cannot resist now and then when luring baits are laid before him, though such ventures invariably result in violent and profane protests from Aurora. The pick and shovel are the only claims I have 
any confidence in now, the miner concludes from one fierce outburst. My back is sore, and my hands are blistered with handling them today. But even the pick and shovel did not inspire confidence a little later. He writes that the work goes slowly, very slowly, but that they still hope to strike it some day. But if we strike it rich, I've lost my guess, that's all. Then he adds, couldn't go on the hill today. It snowed. It always snows here, I expect. And the final heartsick line, don't you suppose they have pretty much quit writing at home? This is midsummer, and snow still interferes with the work. One feels the dreary uselessness of the quest. Yet resolution did not wholly die, or even enthusiasm. These things were as recurrent as new prospects, which were plentiful enough. In a still subsequent letter he declares that he will never look upon his mother's face again, or his sister's, or get married, or revisit the banner state, until he is a rich man, though there is less assurance than desperation in the words. In Roughing It, the author tells us that when flour had reached one dollar a pound and he could no longer get the dollar, he abandoned mining and went to milling as a common laborer in a quartz mill at ten dollars a week. This statement requires modification. It was not entirely for the money that he undertook the laborious task of washing riffles and screening tailings. The money was welcome enough, no doubt, but the greater purpose was to learn refinering, so that when his mines developed he could establish his own mill and personally superintend the work. It is like him to wish us to believe that he was obliged to give up being a mining magnate to become a laborer in a quartz mill, for there is a grim humor in the confession. That he abandoned the milling experiment at the end of a week is a true statement. He got a violent cold in the damp place, and came near getting salivated, he says in a letter, working in the quicksilver and chemicals. I hardly think I shall try the experiment again. It is a confining business, and I will not be confined for love or money. As recreation after this trying experiment, Higby took him on a tour, prospecting for the traditional cement mine, a lost claim where, in a deposit of cement rock, gold nuggets were said to be as thick as raisins in a fruitcake. They did not find the mine, but they visited Mono Lake, that ghastly, lifeless alkali sea among the hills, which, in roughing it, he has so vividly pictured. It was good to get away from the stress of things, and they repeated the experiment. They made a walking trip to Yosemite, carrying their packs, camping and fishing in that far, tremendous isolation, which in those days few human beings had ever visited at all. Such trips furnished a delicious respite from the fevered struggle around tunnel and shaft. Amid mountain peaks, giant forests, and by tumbling falls, the quest for gold hardly seemed worth while. More than once that summer he went alone into the wilderness to find his balance and to get away entirely from humankind. End of chapter 35 The Miner Read by John Greenman